Okay, I'd like to welcome you to the, this uh, Prepare, Stay, and Defend uh, webinar. And uh, this is Paula Nasiaka, the Center Manager for the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center. And we're really excited, the International Association of Wildland Fire and the Lessons Learned Center, to work together to present this to you. And we really thank all the panelists and Stan and, and Josh for, and Brenna for organizing this. So I'll turn it over to you, Chuck. Okay, and I'd also like to uh, extend my uh, welcome and appreciation for everybody's attendance. Uh, we seem to have a, a fairly good global uh, audience. Um, this is an important topic, uh, protecting civilian populations and property, um, also in uh, the role of homeowners and their responsibility uh, for assuming various lifestyles and protecting the properties associated with those lifestyles. Um, so with that, uh, I believe uh, we turn it over to uh, Dan Bailey, who's going to be our moderator. Uh, Dan's one of the IWF board members and a member of the International Code Council. So, Dan? Okay, thanks, Chuck. And uh, again, uh, uh, welcome uh, to everyone uh, for today's webinar. I think that we have a very timely uh, topic uh, that uh, talks about the, uh, the issue of prepare, stay, and defend, or go early from an international perspective. And we have a uh, unique group of qualified uh, experts that are going to uh, share with you some of their thoughts and insights about this kind of much debated topic. And our experts are from around the world, so we'll get a, a, a nice cross-section of uh, thoughts and, uh, uh, from, uh, from our panelists today. But first, before we kick off the webinar, I have a few quick notes uh, just from a technical standpoint about the webinar today, especially for those of you that are new to the process, just a, uh, a quick uh, kind of overview. Um, again, for the webinar control panel for attendees, uh, for the GoToWebinar attendee interface, it's made up of two parts. The viewer window is where the attendees see the uh, presenter screen. And then the viewer window can be resized by clicking and dragging on that lower right-hand corner. Um, and then the control panel itself is where, the, uh, where, as attendees, you can interact with the organizers and the presenters. By clicking the arrows on the, the, the grab tab, uh, it opens and closes the control panel. So it's relatively easy to use. Uh, the audio pane uh, provides audio information. You have uh, either your computer uh, with your mic and speakers or uh, call in on the phone. Remember to, to mute uh, so we don't have kind of feedback uh, for those that are uh, uh, not speaking. Um, and let's see, attendees uh, can also communicate with the organizers and the presenters uh, through the question box. And you'll see a few questions that will pop up. Uh, please answer those, uh, uh, and uh, we'll get back to you kind of what the results of those are. And if you have questions for the uh, uh, panelists as we go through the programs, uh, go ahead and uh, submit those questions, and, and at the conclusion of the, the conference, we'll try to get as many of those answered as we can. And then uh, for those that we don't get answered, we'll uh, get back to you by uh, email afterwards. So with that, let's move on to our program. Our first presenter for the, uh, the afternoon uh, program uh, is uh, Gary Morgan. Gary is the Chief uh, Executive Officer of the Bushfire Cooperative Research Center, which was uh, set up in, 19, in 2003 uh, to coordinate uh, bushfire research across Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, the bushfire uh, um, Cooperative Research Center has more than 40 projects uh, working on uh, uh, various aspects of social, economic, and environmental uh, uh, considerations to, uh, to bushfires in Australia and New Zealand. And Gary has been with the uh, with that group since its beginning and has uh, previously been responsible for maintaining uh, strong links between research organizations and the fire and land management agencies in Australia and New Zealand. Gary uh, is educated as a forester from the Creswick School of Forestry and the University of Melbourne. Uh, Gary has uh, had uh, many positions within the state government uh, in uh, Victoria, including the chief of uh, chief fire officer for Victoria for more than nine years. 
So he has a uh, very uh, unique uh, background and uh, will uh, provide us with some very interesting insight, I'm sure. So please welcome our first presenter, Gary Morgan. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, what I wish to do now... Uh, Dan, is that coming through clearly? Yeah, you're good. Okay, I'll, I'll prepare. Sorry, I've just got another screen as well. That's fine. Um, what I propose to do is provide the Australian perspective on prepared to leave early or stay in a pen. This is a position that has been referred to in many quarters as the stay or go policy, simply stay or go. Um, the prepare, leave early or stay in the pen position was developed over many years. It is based on research, experience and history. It has been introduced nationally through a consultative process involving all Australian fire agencies. It was developed by APAC as a common position prepared for member agencies and informs the agency's policies, APAC being the peak fire body for Australia and New Zealand. The current position is set out in APAC's position paper on bushfires, community safety 2005, and can be found on the APAC website. This position paper has a number of elements that outline the broader context of which stay or go is just a part, and I'll go through these elements. At the outset, I'd also like to acknowledge the many individuals and agencies who have over many years developed and refined this approach. I certainly do not espouse to be the expert on this. First, let me say something quickly about the nature of fires in southeastern Australia, which is where our greatest life and property losses have occurred. We have been very, we have very productive forests, which lead to massive fuel loads. These fuels are volatile, and combustion of gases can be quite dramatic, and in severe fires, be almost explosive. When our eucalypts fuel burn, and we often see massive short distance spotting resulting in suppression challenges. As you may see on the screen, the, the major uh, spotting that, that can occur. In addition to that uh, short distance spotting, the long distance flight of burning bark, uh, which may be uh, as long as your arms, carried a lot for up to uh, tens of kilometres. While the land that they create new fires and those enormous challenges for predicting fire location, of course, for planning, we want to warn the communities. Bushfires are common and a normal occurrence. Indeed, Australia's vegetation has evolved with fire, and fire has shaped Australia's ecosystems. Bushfires can cause death and injury to people and animals, and damage to property, the natural environment, and other community assets. Losses can be reduced. Not all will be saved, however. Managing risks and reducing loss is a shared responsibility between government, householders and land managers. In fighting fires, the firefighting resource will not always be able to protect every property. It's been clearly told to the communities. And in extreme events, if suppression is not successful in the first few minutes, but the fire brigades often find that they can only mop up after the event. People need to prepare then stay and defend their property or leave early. And most agency public education programs have worked hard through a variety of sophisticated community education and community development programs to encourage people to develop plans. People who cannot cope with bushfires, whether they're old, infirmed or mentally not prepared, should relocate well before the fire impacts on them. Research on past fire events has shown that houses have survived the passage of the fire front and have protected the occupants from the fire. Occupants have successfully defended their houses before, during and after the fire front. Again, research on past fire events has shown that last minute evacuations is the most dangerous option of all. Cars provide extreme fall protection from fire in addition to historical experience, recent bushfire CRC research has provided experimental evidence for this. In Australia, mass evacuation is not the favoured option. 
the nature of the eye behaviour with the long distance spotting I spoke about before make it very difficult to conduct planned evacuations once a fire has started. The decision whether to order an evacuation should be made by the lead fire combat authority. It is not ruled out as an option, but in some cases it may be appropriate. The position also acknowledges that road access must be carefully managed during fire events. Not a road block, but a control with community and firefighter safety. It is essential for people in threatened communities to have ready access to accurate information to assist in decision making. Provision of information or warnings to communities is a complex matter. It is not just about the technology. This is part of the solution. We also need a prepared and engaged community with situation awareness so that we actually have the information to instigate a meaningful warning. Then we need messages that are properly constructed and we need appropriate action to be taken by the recipients. Fire emergency plans should be developed for all areas with a bushfire risk. They should be comprehensive and include all relevant people both agencies and communities. That involves the land managers, the fire agencies and all appropriate tiers of government. Land use planning should be used to enhance community resilience for the bushfire. This recognises the need to utilise regulatory controls such as land use planning to determine where development should occur and what measures such as roads, water supplies and vegetation management should be put in place to mitigate the risk from bushfires. Finally, fire agencies should facilitate and support community recovery. It is well known that well-conducted recovery can significantly reduce the trauma and aid communities' well-being. The position adopted by the fire agencies in Australia is based on evidence. Recently, this evidence has been consolidated into a publication by the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre titled Community Bushfire Safety. This book is a comprehensive summary of the findings from all the community safety projects in the Bushfire CRC, drawing from the social sciences, economics and law. The editors were John Hanmer and Kat Haynes, and it is available through CSIRO Publishing. Fundamentally, there are two key elements of evidence and research underpinning the fire agency's position. Firstly, factors that have led to civilian deaths Last minute evacuations have been the greatest cause of death. The second element of evidence in research underpinning the position is that research into how houses are ignited and destroyed in bushfires. This has repeatedly shown that embers before, during and after the fire front have been the key cause of house ignitions. Such ignitions have usually been successfully doused by able occupants. Further, Buildings also provide protection from radiant heat. That's been a great risk to the human life. Thus there is the mantra, people save houses and houses save people. However, we have, big, have had big fires before. Bigger ones, as we can see on the left of the screen there, and we have actually lost more houses on the right hand side of the screen but not as many people if you look in the middle. In recent fires, there have been significantly higher loss than the experience before. We lost 173 people in Victoria just recently in February. This has led to questioning of the existing position. A Royal Commission, which is the highest level of inquiry in our country, is currently underway, and you may watch it wherever you are on the web. Ongoing uh, research prior to the February fires this year has revealed that about 60% of people were likely to wait and see rather than leave early or stay and defend. So we are constantly challenging, learning and revising our approach. So there is widespread recognition that the position is logical. However, there is more research to do better to do to better understand the circumstances around the deaths. Roughly two-thirds of the deaths in Victoria were within buildings. 
Initial findings, not comprehensive or analysed, suggest that many people were unprepared for the severity of the February 7 bushfires in Victoria. Some of those who intended to stay and defend left because of the severe conditions. There also appear to have been many late evacuations. Fire plans did not always go to plan and there was much ad hoc decision making. And finally, there are a couple of themes emerging. The industry has started to look at how fire danger forecasts or the like can be used to not only describe the nature of the day, but the nature of the fire in ways that are meaningful to the public and can then be used as a call to action. The question being asked is, is the fire danger rating systems relevant to communities? And do we develop common terminologies that can also form the basis of warnings? The industry is now considering how better to get the message across to the public so that we have safer communities. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge especially uh, Dr. Noreen Cruzel, who's actually with me and uh, participate in any questions later on for this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And again, if you uh, have uh, questions, uh, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, ask those questions by going to the, uh, the, the box on your control panel. And there are quick polls coming up as well uh, throughout all of the presentations. Take some time to answer those real quickly, and we'll follow up uh, with uh, the results of uh, those polls uh, uh, throughout uh, the presentations. Our next uh, presenter uh, for, this, uh, for this very timely uh, discussion is uh, uh, Jack Cohen. Uh, Jack is uh, a uh, uh, unique individual uh, from the standpoint of the background in wildland fire, and we uh, are real happy to have him with us uh, Today, Jack is a research uh, physical scientist involved in wildland research since 1972 uh, with the U.S. Forest Service here in the United States. He's worked in the research fire laboratory, laboratories in uh, Missoula, Montana, Riverside, California, as well as uh, Macon, Georgia. He was the co-developer of the uh, U.S. National Fire Danger Rating System and has uh, contributed to the development of the U.S. Fire Behavior Prediction Systems. At the Riverside Fire Lab, uh, Jack uh, conducted research on live fuel fire behavior in Southern California chaparral types and was uh, quite involved in the prescribed fire program there as well. Since 1989, Jack has focused his research on how wildland urban interface fire disasters occur and how uh, homes ignite during extreme fire behavior. He's one of the principal scientists involved in the uh, International Crown Fire Modeling Experiment that uh, occurred in the Northwest Territories in Canada from 1997 to 2001, where he uh, investigated the thermal characteristics of Crown Fire related to structure ignition. Jack currently divides his time uh, with research between wildland urban interface fire issues and understanding uh, live fuel shrub and tree canopy fire behavior processes uh, with active Crown Fires. Please welcome uh, Jack Cohen. Thank you, Dan. I uh, appreciate the, the introduction. And let me uh, confirm that people can see my screen. Um, not yet. Is that right? Because uh, I have not yet. Was that supposed to be automatic? You should have gotten a message to accept the sharing your screen. I did not get a message. All right. It says that you're. It says that we're showing your screen. Is it up? Welcome to going to webinar. What event may be easy? Welcome to the webinar. Here, Jack, I'm going to switch it back to me, and I'll switch it back to you. Okay. <clears throat> oh, okay. Okay. Here we go. 
Here we go. How's that? There we go. Okay. Good. So if there are any problems, let me know. So uh, the presentation that I'm going to give uh, really focuses on the idea that stay and defend is an option rather than necessarily a policy. Let me... Okay, but, but particularly recently, uh, it's, it, the discussion seems to be a, a stay and defend team against uh, an evacuation team. It's, it seems to be uh, rendering down to some kind of a fire agency, firefighter policy uh, 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 confrontation rather than really a life safety options discussion during wildland urban interface fires. And so I, it seems to me that we could all agree that increasing options for effective life safety and property protection should be our goal for all wildland urban interface fire situations and that evacuation as a life safety option uh, is not necessarily always safe. But our general procedure is to evacuate residents during a, an extreme wildland urban interface fire. And largely, we don't have alternatives to residential evacuation. So the question I would ask is, do we really have other options than evacuation, including poorly planned late evacuation notices? And I would suggest that if a house doesn't ignite during a wildfire, then being in a house is safer than evacuation certainly just ahead of a wildfire, but if the house doesn't burn, if it doesn't ignite and burn, then why would we even jeopardize going out and potentially being exposed to a wildfire? Well, but there are obvious uncertainties with regard to staying in your house and assuming that it won't burn, and so certainly the home ignition potential is an uncertainty, but I would also suggest that safe evacuation also has its uncertainties. So let me start with the, by exploring uh, the home ignition potential. And what I'm going to do is to cover some of the research that I've done on fire, wildland urban interface fire disasters and uh, how home ignitions occur during those disasters. So I started with modeling and experiments, and this is the kind of, of, of fire exposure that I studied with regard to the field experiments. And the results of the modeling and with experimental validation indicate that radiant heating during crown fires does not ignite homes at distances greater than 30 meters. Well, and in fact, the results of the experiments showed that three out of the seven wall sections at roughly 33 feet from the forest edge uh, did not ignite, and there were no wall ignitions or even scorch uh, at, at, the, at 66 feet and beyond. And the picture that you see here is of a wall section that did not ignite at 33 feet from the crown fire. Well, so I've also done examinations of actual disasters because the modeling and the experiments certainly don't cover the range of the, the actual wildland or interface disasters. And the case study examinations indicate that homes are not igniting directly from extreme wildfires where flame to house distances are beyond 100 feet. The ignitions are occurring, certainly, but from lesser intensity sources initiated by the wildfire. So this is the kind of scene that we typically see after a disaster, where the, the canopy foliage is unconsumed surrounding a totally destroyed house. Well, in addition, homes commonly ignite and or burn hours after the wildfire has ceased its extreme fire behavior. And the home home destruction becomes independent of the wildfire. In essence, in many residential areas, we end up with the residential area spreading the fire. muted. Oh, 
Okay. Um, what you see here is surface fire making contact. This is low intensity fire uh, that has made surface contact with the structure, resulting in the total destruction in this particular case. Uh, it's obvious that low intensity fire spread to contact this house. So disaster examinations reveal that most homes destroyed during extreme wildfires are not ignited directly by the intense wildfire. It's not that intense wildfire can't ignite homes, and clearly that's the case. It's that they're not igniting the homes. And the reason is because high intensity wildfires typically aren't spreading through the residential developments. The residential development breaks the forest canopy continuity resulting in fires largely spreading on the surface within the community and in many cases a highly vegetated residential area. The access roads, the driveways, utility quarters, and the house site itself produce gaps in the forest tree canopy sufficient to discontinue the high intensity crown fires but not the destruction of the homes. So the, the homes are continuing to ignite either directly from firebrands and or igniting in the materials within the community to spread to the house. And this is the kind of scene that we get, where we have crown fire spreading in from the right that's to the first residential street, no high intensity fire after that, but another two and a half blocks of total house destruction. And here's another example from 2007 in Southern California. And this also includes uh, some of the fires in Victoria this last February, February where we see uh, in King Lake total destruction of houses surrounded by unconsumed tree canopy. Well, so fire doesn't spread to homes like an avalanche or a flash flood where a mass engulfs objects in its path. Fire only spreads to locations along its path that meet the requirements for combustion, and that includes homes. Well, that's kind of a duh. But do we actually really see that when we see scenes like this, where the wildfire in the background is, is separated from the house destroyed by a house that survived? And so the requirements for sustained ignition typically occur over small distances, obviously less than the distance between these houses. Well, so what about firebrands? Well, the extreme wildland urban interface wildfires commonly produce firebrands that directly ignite homes and or fires within the residential area that spread to the homes. This is a good example where a highly flammable wood roof shows its spot ignitions. And here's a comfort station in the middle of a golf course where there was absolutely no fire in this vicinity closer than about 300 yards away, 300 meters away, and it's totally destroyed from firebrand spotting. So the research findings indicate that given an extreme wildfire, the home characteristics in relation to the area surrounding the home within 30 meters principally determine the, the potential for home ignitions, and I call this the home ignition zone. Here's an example of a home ignition zone. And what this does is it provides us at least with clues for opportunities to have that low ignition potential house during extreme wildfires. The ignition resistant home ignition zones provide options for increasing life safety and effective property protection. So what about the uncertainties with regard to evacuations? Are resident evacuations always the safest action and what is it too late to evacuate safely? So the leave early part of prepare to stay and defend or leave early, well, do we leave after the first lightning storm on a dry, during a dry summer? Or when the hot dry winds start to blow without any ignitions? Or how about the beginning of fire season? So when do we leave early? Frequently, extreme wildfires can develop and spread to homes within hours. So let, in, the, in the first afternoon of extreme fire behavior, like pictured in this, in this particular picture, we can have the fire spread to residential development. But given that preparation, this home represents a, a, a safe shelter from a wildfire that perhaps we would be exposed to 
if we didn't have the chance to evacuate early. So ignition-resistant home ignition zones provide life safety options for residents when an evacuation is unsafe and staying to defend by choice. So what I mean by that is essentially we should prepare to stay and defend even if we plan to leave early because leaving early might not be possible. So from my standpoint, prepare to stay and defend even if you plan to leave early is not about replacing firefighters or putting property above lives. What I'm talking about here is that that if we prepare sufficiently, then we're not talking about significant fire suppression actions that would be taken by homeowners. It's about increasing options for life safety and property protection during uncertain extreme fire behavior conditions. And we do that by producing and maintaining an ignition resistant home ignition zone that provides a more certain and viable safety zone than urgently escaping an oncoming extreme wildfire. It's about options not policy. Thank you. Our and first poll that we presented uh, to uh, our uh, participants uh, asked the question about uh, 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 where, is, where are you located? About 83% of uh, our participants this afternoon said they were from 13% uh, uh, from Australia, about 9% from Canada. 76% from the U.S. and 3% from other countries. So we have a, a, a nice uh, variety of uh, participants from, uh, uh, from Australia, Canada, and, uh, and the United States. And uh, we, again, welcome everyone this afternoon or this morning uh, in the case of uh, some of our uh, uh, participants.